First of all, I want to thank all of you for your very kind notes that you send uh, myself and, and Father Kyle, thanking us for taping these, these masses for you. And I want to assure you of this. This is a pleasure. We're happy to do it for you. And we understand that you have no choice but to be at home. And it's better that you should be at, be at home if uh, you have any sort of a condition and all, or if it's just too dangerous for you, for you to take any chances with regards to COVID. We feel bad that you're stuck at home, but we're just happy to be able to do this, do this for you. I want to focus today on the second reading. It's from Paul's letter to the Romans. Now, this is the beginning of the 12th chapter. And for the first 11 chapters, Paul takes a deep look at the mysteries of the gospel. But then he begins to teach from chapter 12 on the way that the Christians should live their lives. So he has these two verses, which are really introductory verses. I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to offer up your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, your spiritual worship. Do not conform yourselves to this age, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and pleasing and perfect. The gospel of the Lord demands that we give ourselves up to God as a living sacrifice. We are to follow Christ, who gave himself up as a living sacrifice to the Father. And so many of you do exactly that with your lifestyle. How often I hear about people whose lives revolve around caring for others in their families, in the workplace, in the neighborhood, and all of this takes sacrifice. I just, I just spoke to a young mother whose life has gone from caring for one after another of her parents and in-laws and grandparents, and yet she still has to care for her husband and her children. There's, no, there's little or no time for herself, but she doesn't regret this. This is her lifestyle, and her life is a living sacrifice to God. I remember an elderly man, a widower, who had married an elderly woman. They were both in their 80s. After a few years of marriage, she was stricken with cancer in her face. And it was horrible. It took part of her nose, her jaw, her cheek. But the man cared for her and protected her dignity by limiting those who could see her. When his wife passed, I said to him that he had been a wonderful husband. And he looked at me as though I was clueless. And I was. And he said, well, I took vows, didn't I? He took vows to live the Christian way. He gave up his life, his own pleasures for his wife. He became a living sacrifice, not just for her, but to God who bound him to her. You know, we priests in so many ways, we have the greatest lives ever because we get to witness the lives of so many great Christians, so many of you all. Paul warns us not to conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of our mind so that we may discern what, God, what the will of God is, what is good, pleasing, and perfect. It's easy. It's easy to conform to the world. It's easy to just go along with what everybody else is doing without even considering how our actions could devastate our spiritual lives. Our spiritual radar should go up when we hear someone say, it's a new world now. Things have changed. Everyone is doing this or that. We need to ask ourselves, am I willing to sacrifice my spiritual life to join what people say everyone is doing? You think about that. That's what sin is, isn't it? 
Sin is pushing God aside for the sake of conforming to the world. In Jesus' prayer to his Father in John 17, 16, he prays for us and he says, they are not of the world, even as I am not of, of the world. When we conform to that which is not the Christian way of life, we're actually going against our very being, our essence as Christians. Sin leaves us disjointed, disjointed with ourselves, at war with ourselves. It steals our identity from us. In Jeremiah 2, the prophet warns the people and us that when we seek that which is worthless, we become worthless. It's so very correct when we say, I cannot do that. I'm so much better than that. We don't have to conform. We can be transformed by the renewal of our mind and soul. Our Protestant brothers and sisters will often talk about being born again. We Catholics do not believe in a second baptism, but we do believe that we come to a fuller understanding of whom we are as sons and daughters of God. And this understanding gives us new life and a new determination to live the Christian life, to live it in its fullness. C.S. Lewis wrote, if you live for the next world, you will get this one in the deal. But if you live only for this one, you'll lose them both. Recently, I've been reading an old biography of St. Francis of Assisi. It was written by the wonderful British Catholic author and scholar, G.K. Chesterton. G.K. Chesterton's style is elegant, flowery, even poetic. Now he points out that St. Francis freed himself not just of possessions, but of his attachment to the world around him. And as a result, he appreciated God's gifts more than any man of his time, maybe more than any man ever, the side of Jesus Christ. St. Francis had nothing, but he owned everything. And he was overwhelmed with the beauty of God's creation. He saw people as the greatest beauty of creation. So he would call out to brother, sun, and sister, moon, and birds, and other animals, hills, and streams, and lakes, and particularly other people as gifts of God, reflecting his presence. Francis gave up everything to live for God, and he possessed everything. The poor man of Assisi was the richest man in the world. He lived for the next world and received the great gifts of this world. He was transformed by his refusal to conform. You duped me, Lord, and I allowed myself to be duped, Jeremiah says in our first reading. Commitment to the Lord carries the cost of rejecting those elements of the world where he is not present. And like Jeremiah, we want God in our lives, but we don't appreciate the cost when the, when the cost becomes personal. Yet like Jeremiah, we live for the fire burning within us, the fire of God's love. And we allow ourselves to be duped. We want God. The problem with you is that you are thinking like the world does, not like God does. Jesus told that disciple he had just called his rock. Peter wanted to prevent Jesus from dying. Jesus said that the devil would want to prevent God's plan from taking place, and he actually called Peter a devil. Get behind me, Satan. You know, Jesus was more upset with Peter for this comment than he was when Peter denied him three times. Why? What did Peter do that was so wrong? He allowed himself to be drawn away from the kingdom of God. He was conforming to the world. We cannot allow this to happen. A world that is darkness needs us to be light. People are looking for hope. People are searching for a reason to live. We can give them that hope. We can give them a reason for life. 
we can be the light of Christ for others. We do not have to conform to a world of darkness. We can be transformed by God. Then we will experience all that is good and pleasing and perfect. God bless you.